So let me ask you, what's your theory as to why mainstream media has treated you so harshly? Because, you so know, Crystal and I were just talking about this earlier. <laughs> what's that, Andrew? We missed that. I was just saying, like, why have they treated me so shabbily, so shabbily? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Crystal and I were talking about this earlier. There was just a New York Times article that came out. The headline, what was the headline again? Headline was like, new poll shows the leading candidate in the New York mayor's race is undecided. And of course, the poll has you up, but they don't mention that until like six paragraphs in. And then it's all these caveats about it, why you being up in the poll doesn't really mean that you're ahead in the race. And, and I've seen absurd criticisms that <laughs> like, you're somehow soft on white supremacists or alt-right or like my favorite one is anti-asian <laughs> <laughs> like so why why what's your theory as to why they've treated you so negatively and why alternative media has actually treated you so favorably <laughs> wow i mean i like i hadn't really seen it as like you know so cut and dried in terms of uh i mean certainly alternative media i'll start there i think that folks like the two of you uh, and independent voices and podcasters, I mean, mo for the most part, you all uh, rely upon your own judgment and independent point of view, and that's why people like you and follow you. And, and so if you spend time with a candidate like me or dig into my ideas and you think, oh, well, I might not agree with every aspect of this, but this is interesting, um, and so let me explore that. Uh, and that's been the kind of reception I've gotten from many independent voices and, and podcasters and what you characterize the alternate uh, alternative media, Kyle. In terms of the, the mainstream media, I think it's frankly like the inverse dynamic where like I, I'm not someone that for the most part they have been able to uh, trade access with for years and years. <laughs> and so um, my... Uh, rise in popularity or the fact that I'm leading in the polls is something that they find uh, somewhat foreign or threatening, uh, I guess, because it's like from outside of the institutions that they've spent so much time uh, within or trafficking with. Um, and so I just think there's like this native resistance, um, but it is it has been disappointing. Like you hope that journalists would frankly use their heads, use their judgment, look up and say, well, Let's say in, in this case, Andrew Yang's leading the polls and it's, instead of trying to poo poo that, dig into like, why is that? And if they dug into why it is, they would find that a lot of people in New York City are very frustrated with uh, politics as usual. And they're not that excited about electing someone who's been embedded in some of these uh, low functioning institutions for years and years and years. All right, so Andrew, you know I love you and am not unbiased where you're concerned, um, but I also want to level with you. I really hated what you wrote about BDS in an op-ed that was generally about your approach to the, to the Jewish community. You said a Yang administration will push back against the BDS movement, which singles out Israel for unfair economic punishment. Not only is BDS rooted in anti-Semitic thought and history, hearkening back to fascist boycotts of Jewish businesses, it's also a direct shot at New York City's economy. Do you see criticism of Israel as fundamentally anti-Semitic? I do not see criticism of Israel as fundamentally anti-Semitic. Um, I think BDS is a very different thing than criticism of, uh, let's say, the Netanyahu administration uh, or even of uh, some of Israel's policies. Well, it's an attempt to push back on the occupation of the, the occupied territories, that what's seen as an illegal op occupation by international law. It's modeled on the successful movement in South Africa. It's nonviolent. What is it about that movement that you single out to say that is anti-Semitic and equivalent, I mean, you equate it essentially to fascism? BDS specifically as an organization, as a movement, uh, has refused to disavow extremist elements that have frankly uh, declared uh, that Israel does not even have a right to exist. So that's quite extreme. It's very, very different than what you described earlier, Crystal, in terms of people having a political point of view on Israel or an administration or its policies. So it's not the tactics per se, but some of the people that are involved that they haven't uh, condemned or distanced themselves from? Is that the issue? Well, so BDS as an organization, as a movement, uh, has refused to, uh, to disavow uh, extremist elements that have essentially said Israel does not have a right to exist. So, Andrew, uh, let me ask you this then, because the more I looked into BDS, the more I saw nuances and perhaps, you know, 
it, it doesn't make the most sense to take the most extremist elements of of a group and define the whole movement that way. And you know, we've learned that lesson in the context of other movements and other groups. But would you concede that there's a difference between, say, boycotts, divestment, and sanctions of all of Israel versus boycott, divestment, and sanctions specifically of the illegally occupied territories? Because again, as Crystal pointed out, that is the model that effectively worked in apartheid South Africa. No, I'm not sure I, I understand the distinction you're drawing, Kyle, genuinely. Like, I'm just not sure I understand it. Um, right. I can explain it further if you want. It's the areas that it's all, it's, it's a matter of historical record and fact that are being illegally occupied right now, that the international community all agrees. There's no dispute over it. Some elements of the BDS movement only want to boycott, divest, and sanction from those particular areas. So in other words, the other areas of Israel, they leave alone, but particularly the occupied territories, they say, let's do boycotts, divestment, and sanctions in order to try to bring about Palestinian human rights. Don't you think there's a difference between boycotting in the areas specifically where they're violating international law and boycotting areas where they're not? Uh, I'm on the record as supporting a two-state solution, which I think is a, a fairly uh, mainstream perspective. And if I understand your question, uh, Kyle, you know, people who are advocating for a two state solution, uh, I would agree with that sentiment. So here's the other thing about it, Andrew. Why did you want to make this statement? Because I guess what bothered me, I'm just leveling with you on this, like you'd taken some criticism in the Orthodox Jewish community because of the position you had and some of the statements you made about circumcision. And then you put on this statement. I mean, I know you make the case BDS is tied to New York City's economy. It's kind of a tenuous connection there. Why was it that you decided to make this statement? Because it felt... I'll just be frank with you. It felt like pandering, which is not something that you normally do because you'd taken criticism in this other area and you wanted to go over, you know, over and above to signal your support here. Just talk a little bit about your thinking of why you thought it was important to put this in per this particular op-ed. The economic ties between New York City and Israel are very, very significant and very real. So I wouldn't just uh, put that aside, Crystal, especially if you're in the situation New York's in now. Um, and uh, with the, the, so, sorry, you said something else in, in your, oh, it was, uh, uh, it was around whether this was sort of an over, uh, like a, a response to something that had gone before. Um, it, it's genuinely uh, the case that New York City is the home to more Jews uh, than any place outside of Israel. It's like a very, very serious uh, responsibility to the global Jewish community. Um, and it's something that I would take very seriously as mayor. Uh, and so, you know, it, it's something that I think you do have to think about the context of New York City for the, the global community in that light. And that was frankly a bit of a learning for me where I, I frankly did not realize just the level of importance of the mayoralty of New York City to the global community. So final follow up on this, then I promise we'll let it go. But my question is if, if Palestinians resist violently, that they, that's called terrorism. Everybody says it's terrorism, they denounce it. If they can't resist peacefully through boycotts and sanctions and an economic approach, what approach would you say is okay? Like how can they resist to try to bring about human rights and end the occupation and, and have a state? How can they resist that's acceptable if they can't do it peacefully and they can't do it violently? Uh, I, I think that that's an oversimplification, Kyle. I think that there are many peaceful ways to advocate for a two-state solution uh, that don't involve uh, some of the measures that BDS has recommended.